My name is Cal Molone from Richmond, Virginia, and I'm an anarchist. And today, on the 18th of October, I'm here to start off the 11th episode of The Resistance. But before we begin the news from Underground Storage, I'm going to announce the event that's going to happen here at the Nevermore Anarchy Garden, and that's our first strategy meeting. And this is a place where anyone's welcome to bring in and to share your ideas and strategies to how to best end statism, or the, the steps and measures that we should be taking now to achieve real freedom in our lifetime. Some aside from uh, mass communication, different ways to, to spread this message aside from the regular uh, spreading anarchy activism that we do out there together, uh, some of the ideas on the table also include putting together a business plan for a dispute resolution organization. Um, and finding different ways to kind of put these goals in attainment and, and reaching um, the, to the point where we can proceed past, uh, I guess, the negotiation part. You know, in the beginning it could be something where we provide dispute resolution services um, before we can start providing security services. But again, this kind of falls into how all this is going to start wherever you are. It's going to start off with uh, the basic simple premise, the basic simple principles that we share with the non-aggression principle and just kind of build off from there. Um, much like the punk movement and that in the beginning of uh, a lot of these bands like uh, with Minor Threat, uh, a lot of the people didn't know what they were doing. Well, they, they knew that they wanted to create music, they wanted to create art, they wanted to create different ways to, to, to connect with, with one another. And it's not as, as such that they were perfect in these particular areas that uh, they play their musical instruments or, or sing or uh, performed, but along the way they got better. Along the way they find ways to keep refining, improving, um, and finding ways to keep moving forward with, with, with those ideas. And that's pretty much how this movement um, is going to be. Wherever you are, whatever community you live in, when you, when you start your own uh, liberty movement there too, that uh, for the most part uh, it's a continuing refining effort. It's a continuing way to keep improving upon these ideas and problems to, to continue to get to a better place. And that's how a lot of this is going to start off, um, including this show. <laughs> Along the way, with your critiques, with your criticisms, uh, good ideas, uh, this will continue to improve. And I'm in it for the long haul. <laughs> I'm in it until I'm finally free. Um, and, and taking no shortcuts uh, to get there. So this is a learning experience as much for, for myself and for, for everyone else who's, who's involved, for anyone else who, again, wants real freedom in their lifetime. And so that's how a lot of this stuff is going to play out. Um, you know, we're not looking for perfection. We're always looking for different ways to keep improving. And that's uh, the mindset you should take in, you know, especially when you go out there and talk to people. You know, a lot of people may not understand or, or get some of the points for uh, for anarchism, but don't take it too hard. Don't take it that uh, that's a, a criticism. Um, just take that as a critique for yourself. Like, well, let's look at and examine different ways I could have improved that form of uh, presenting that idea. Um, you know, leave alone the, the negative parts and look into the good positive areas that of that experience. You know, there's no substitute for experience. There's no substitute for having that conversation and ex further examining and evaluating where I could have improved and where uh, certain maybe words or um, I so let go. Um, and so that's uh, and that's that goes for me. You know, don't be too stubborn to try something new. Um, and so one of the uh, the last ideas that we're going to be talking about, well, some of the ideas on the table, again, the last one I want to bring up is the uh, first Liberate RVA Freedom Festival that we want to start uh, beginning next year. There's some prospects of uh, land area. Uh, we have a good friend looking into this 40 acre um, this area, too, not that far from Richmond as well. So we want to find a place where it's as enjoyable and comfortable and free as a community where we can just, just celebrate life for maybe a weekend and show what a free and voluntary society looks like uh, when we're all together and just having fun and celebrating and uh, have our you know, first anarchist, voluntarist, agorist uh, freedom gathering here and um, on the eastern coast. Um, you know, I guess mid-Atlantic region and such. So, um, so just a lot of different ideas. There's a lot of um, different ways that we can uh, work together towards achieving real freedom in our lifetime. And so that's next week. That's here at the Nevermore Anarchy Garden. So anyone's more than welcome to come in. Even if um, if I've yet to meet you, it doesn't matter. You're more than welcome to just knock on the door and come right in. Um, it's open to everyone. So yeah, I look forward to meeting you guys there. And so with that, I'll start off the news from Underground Stories. So the first one I like to talk about is three students charged homecoming delayed after Henrico High School fight. Three students have been charged with disorderly conduct following a fight at Henrico High School. The fight broke out around 4.10 p.m. Thursday between two students. While trying to break up the fight, another student refused to cooperate with police. 
So a school resource officer used a taser to stop the fight and called for backup, according to police. That's an interesting name um, that they call the uh, prison guards of the public indoctrination system. Uh, they always give them fancy names, you know. They they rather just not call them a car a guard. You can't really call things for what the what they really are and went under the veil of the matrix that's around us. So it's interesting here they call it a school resource officer. Um, the officer to uh, help instill the authority, you know, the, the falseness of this words of that, that fantasy. The seventeen year old male was taken to the hospital and released as is police procedure when a taser is used. He and the two students involved in the initial fight have all been charged with disorderly conduct. No one else was injured. Police have extra officers at the school now. School officials say homecoming activities scheduled for the last week of October have been postponed indefinitely. Staff told students they want to be sure that they can behave before they set a new date. And this is kind of Troublesome in the area of this is how government and statism uh, teaches and preaches collectivism, right? They don't look at you as an individual. They don't look at you as a person. They don't recognize your name. They don't recognize that you have your own ideas. You have your own beliefs. You own have you have your own uh, preferences, preferences to be net, uh, met and, and provided for. Instead, they look at you collectively. Um, mm. And that's that's what's kind of what, what, what harms society. Um, not then so much that if you want to live in a community as a collector and be known as you know the Borg or as the uh, you know as the hive, perfect as long as it's voluntary. But of course, these public indoctrination schools are nothing are, are not voluntary at all. You're forced to go. You can't even choose your teachers. You can't even choose a class again that you, you do or area of subject you want to learn in. Um, your people who don't even have children are forced to pay for it. And so this is uh, a way how they they punish you collectively, right? Instead of um, the individuals who initiated that fight, who initiated that aggression, of course you step back objectively and it's the state that initiated that aggression by forcing you to pay for it, by forcing you to, to go there even if you want to go there or not. You no, know, you have no choice. And uh, by stepping aside from that, that's how they, they teach collectivism. They punish everyone as a whole. Uh, they looked at uh, the activities and the actions of these three individuals and then look at everyone else and associate those actions with you as well. And that's how they, they tie in history, right? They, that's where the, the word we comes in, you know. Um, the actions of the people in the past who've committed atrocities and crimes, you have nothing uh, to do with that. You weren't there. You were not, that, you were not even alive during that time. You know? So the only responsible, uh, responsibility you have are your own actions. That, that's it. You're not responsible for anyone else's actions. And that's just very important to, to try to understand. But with government, it's easy to do it collectively because then you can, um, you know, curtail individualism. You don't want to teach that. You teach individualism, you teach that, uh, uh, so, I guess, independence again, right? And that's not where they want you to go. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very important, again, to stand up for yourself. Before you stand up for everyone else, it's very important to stand up for yourself. You know, from there you can launch and, and helping to defend those that have yet to understand this. Uh, stand up for, for your family, for your friends, for what's true, for what's right, for, for freedom. The second article is GRTC, caravan price hikes come at a great cost to disabled users. Disabled and elderly bus riders who rely on GRTC's caravan say they're hoping city leaders can still find the funds to help take a heavy financial burden off of them. Richmond City Council voted Monday night to approve fare increases from $2.50 to $3 for basic care service and to impose a $6 one-way fare for extended care service with stretches services to the counties. Brian Montgomery, who suffers from cerebral palsy and cannot drive, says the increase will hit him hard. The disabled man says he makes just over $700 a month and relies on care services to meet critical transportation needs. When you're talking about jumping from $2.50 to $6 a trip each way, that's a heck of a bite out of my budget and I'd rather feed myself and deal with transportation the best way I can. Larry Hagan, director of GRTC's Governmental Relations, <laughs> says the hike is unfortunate but necessary to fill a 780,000 budget gap. Hagen says city funds haven't kept up with the demands for ridership. They can't, it's, it's unfunded. 
there the, are a lot of, a lot of unfunded services that of course they when when they start off these ideas from government they only tell you the price tag for the first year they don't tell you that continually throughout the rest of the years after that is only going to increase he continues to say we've been dealing with um, budget deficits for years now and Hagen says uh, from 2003 to 2013 our fixed route costs went up six percent our care service went up by about 75 percent the basic care service will continue to operate in the city from 4 30 a.m to 8 p.m during the week the extended care service will operate from 6 a.m to 8 p.m including weekends however they're no longer going to operate until 11 p.m and that's <laughs> if you can't see right there as a perfect example how monopolies don't work and not only do they rob you of economic freedom to choose the service to, to provide they even rob people in your community to have the opportunity to compete against those monopolized services whereas uh, this happens to any kind of monopolized service by the government that's violently enforcing that not only again does the cost continue to increase as noted in this article but the quality continues to depreciate as well right uh, cutting off several hours even until 8, 11 p.m right so it's not like so much you have a choice all right it's not like again who cares if uh you know one restaurant closed down you have several other restaurants you can go to all right you, you, who cares if one service provider of a uh, cellular um services is closed down like at t there's sprint there's verizon there's there's other opportunity there's other areas that you can still uh, acquire these services but when government does it they not only hold you at hostage but they have all the further um continue that suffering that you're already beginning with with having to pay for something that uh you have no choice to to select from um and this goes back on the well the i, I guess as an example of how this would work in a free and voluntary society you can look at detroit Detroit as an example of what's eventually going to come here to Richmond. Eventually, a lot of these services are going to be continue to be, uh, the costs will continue to increase and the budget is just going to keep rising and they're going to still try to find different ways to, to steer your money to fund these unfunded liabilities. And again, in Detroit, there's a guy, 25 year old college dropout, who bought those four buses, painted those buses to reflect the geographic regions of Detroit, and these buses will pick you up wherever you are. And this is a result of the mass transit system shutting down, right? So when the government monopolies start to become inefficient as they inevitably will become all of them uh he found an area now to finally able to compete and in his competition he was he's able to provide a much better service to people who want that transportation you know this, this his buses will pick you up wherever you are you know call them text them there's no centralized uh, planning routes um you know these buses also have music these buses have wi-fi these buses have b-y-o-b because the enforcement of the monopoly and law in Detroit is a lot it's difficult to enforce now uh, especially with the budget crisis that's the crisis that they've been experiencing there you know it takes over an hour for the police to even respond to to 911 calls emergencies uh, under which many other times people can be under that life could be under threat um, and there's of course security private security now offering services to the government can't meet so that's um, something to look forward to you know something here in Richmond to start preparing ourselves for you know, start looking towards uh, free market examples, finding ways to we can um, meet these needs for security, for transportation, outside of the violent monopoly of the state. And the third article I'd like to address today is the little girl raids piggy bank to help family on food stamps. Here is $10 for me. When Robert, Roberta Morgan read a story about how Megan Fry works full time and still needs food stamps to feed her family, she wanted to help. The town of Clay Mom decided to send a gift card to Fry so she could buy extra groceries for herself and her three-year-old daughter, Essence. Morgan told her seven-year-old daughter, Helenia, about Fry and explained her plan to help. When I told her, quote, that this family usually didn't have extra money to buy ice cream, cookies, or even gummies, she actually gasped. She asked me if we could bring them some food. Morgan explained to Helena that they couldn't just show up at a stranger's house with food. Helena asked if she could send some of her own money for Essence. Morgan suggested $5, her mother, but she absolutely insisted on $10 from her own piggy bank. Helena then wrote a letter that accompanied the money. Hi Essence, here's $10 from me. You can go to the grocery store and buy what you want. I like ice cream and sprinkles. Sincerely, Helena. Morgan was responding to a story on Syracuse.com. 
and in the post standard about the prevalence of working people who rely on food stamps that featured Fry. And in this particular county, 46% of the households that received food stamps had someone working in 2012. And right now, and as is, uh, has been in the past, uh, past news this past week or so, you know, Congress is debating whether to cut $40 billion from the program over the next 10 years. Again, another uh, example of how un un sustainable these, these programs are. Uh, people in favor of the cuts say the programs have become too lax and advocates for the poor say the cuts would be devastating. And this is something to bear in mind. Um, you know, I, I want to help the poor too. I want to help my community. I want like to be able to have the freedom to choose what capacity I am able to give of my resources, right? You know, the first person you have to take care of is yourself, right? The first person you feed is yourself. <laughs> uh, if you have um, extra resources, if you have extra that you're capable, if you have to, yeah, go for it, right? Um, you know, helping your community also helps you in, in, in the way that, uh, it, it, from that extrapolation, sure. But the, the freedom to be able to do that is very important. You know, don't, don't force people who can't, don't force people who, who don't want to, right? That's not really the kind of money, that kind of help you want to be receiving anyways, right? Um, and so, but you look at um, the history be before the welfare program started, before the war on poverty, I have um, a good article from the Mises Institute that I'd like to share with you and talk about how it was like before the uh, welfare program began and how actually people came and cooperated voluntarily to, to help each other, you know, without the uh, the government forcing their way into into those problems, and uh, so I'll start. You know, these these societies were called the friendly societies, and these existed all across the U.S. They included also in many places in Europe, and I also cover uh, why they no longer exist today and and what happened to them. So these friendly societies. Um, mutual aid societies, also known as fraternalism, refers to social organizations that gathered dues and paid benefits to members facing hardship. According to David Bito from Mutual Aid to Welfare State, there is a great stigma attached to accepting government aid or private charity during the late 18th century and 19th centuries. Mutual aid, on the other hand, did not carry the same stigma. It was based on recipro reciprocity. Today's mutual aid recipient could be tomorrow's donor and vice versa. Mutual aid was particularly popular among the poor and the working class. For instance, in New York City, in 1909, 40% of families earning less than $1,000 a year, little more than a living wage, had members who were in mutual aid societies. Ethnicity, however, was even a greater predictor of mutual aid membership than income. The new immigrants, such as the Germans, Bohemians, and Russians, many of them who were Jews, participated in mutual aid societies at approximately twice the rate of native whites and six times the rate of the Irish. This may have been due to new immigrants' need for enhanced social safety nets. Um, some of these things still uh, continue today uh, in different forms. Uh, I guess in the uh, in Northern Virginia, there's a large uh, Bolivian population, for example, there's a large Bolivian culture that exists there. And uh, growing up in, near DC for, for many years, I've um, I, some of the examples would be to, to in helping each other. They would um, randomly put in uh, their names like in a in a, in a bucket or a, um, a cup, for example, and those names would be drawn out. And the order those names came out, there'd be a number affixed to them. The first one that came out would be the first one to, of the recipient of the uh, community bank that they create. The community bank would involve. Um, say that um, for a simple example, you make uh, you you contribute five hundred dollars. So there's ten people, ten individuals. So that will last ten months. Each individual puts five hundred dollars towards the pot. The number that you extract from the from the from the I guess the cup or the hat uh, will indicate the, the month that you draw all that money for yourself. So uh, the first person who to get picked for the first month will get you know there's some. Um, uh, like, you know, again, uh, if they're contributing a thousand dollars each month and there's 10 individuals, you get ten thousand dollars that first month. Uh, the next month, though, you continue to pay another thousand dollars until the, the month's finally and uh, until the 10th month, until the last person receives their, I guess, collective um, cash that they've put together. And this is a quick and fast way to pay off debts. Um, of course, you can exchange numbers. You can exchange the you know the months that someone's going to receive and and uh, talk to each other about it. But uh, these are things that happen all the time. It's a great way to like if you're in uh, fast need of money, uh, you get together with some 
for some people you trust, uh, some people have earned that uh, respect for one another again, and pulling their resources together to to meet ends needs, and you know that's uh, something that still exists today. <laughs> um, so uh, that's 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 an example how in the past people try to get together and form these mutual aid societies. Uh, so continuing with the article, under Lodge Medicine, the price for healthcare was low. Um, oh, well, well, let me step back for a minute. So by the 1920s, at least one of every three males was a member of a mutual aid society. Members of societies car carried over $9 billion worth of life insurance by 1920. During the same period, lodges dominated the field of health insurance. Numerous lodges offered unemployment benefits. Some black fraternity lodges, taking note of the sporadic nature of African-American employment at the time, allowed members to receive unemployment benefits even if they were up to six months behind in dues. Under lodge medicine, the price for health care was low. Members typically paid $2, about a day's wage, to have yearly access to a doctor's care. You know, minor surgery was frequently included in this fee as well. Non-lodge members typically paid about $2 every doctor's visit during this time period. You know, when people talk about uh, Medicare, you know, how it's difficult for people to to have the hair care and the needs that they, they, that they desire and, and to, to help their life, um, you know, and, and the difficulty, difficult ways that it is today to, to acquire health insurance. You know, now you have Obamacare um, that's uh, making matters even worse. You know, before all this, before Medicaid and Medicare, there existed a lot of different ways people could could have easy access and cheaper access and a healthier access to, to health care. Um, so these low prices for lodges, however, uh, necessarily did not translate to low quality. The Independent Order of Foresters, one of the largest mutual aid societies, frequently touted that the mortality rate of its members was 6.66 per thousand, much lower than the 9.3 per thousand for the general population. Lodges also had incentives to keep down costs. For instance, the Lady Friends of Faith Benevolent, Benevolent Association a black female society would pay members taken ill $2 a week if they saw it, the lodge doctor, and $3 if they didn't. A visiting committee also checked on the claimant to guard against false claims. Members who failed to visit the claimant were found fined a dollar. Mutual aid societies also enforced moral codes. In 1892, the Connecticut Bureau of Labor Statistics found that societies followed the invariable rule of denying benefits for any sickness or disability originating from intemperance, vicious, or immoral conduct. Many societies refused to pay benefits for any injury sustained in the participation in a riot. Some lodges even deny membership to people who manufactured explosives or played professional football. So you find ways that people already find um, mechanism and rules to socially ostracize um, I guess what would be the equivalent of people talking about, uh, I guess, free riders. <laughs> um, so another example of how social ostracism works, you know, the effect of participating in unruly activities or immoral behavior as described here. Uh, now I'm not talking about sports, for example, I'm just talking about in the way like, they're pretty much pointing out that if you're a violent person, you know, picking up fights and uh, initiating that aggression onto others, you know, you're not the kind of person they want to provide or uh, provide this membership to. You're not the kind of person that want involved in that kind of community. A large number of African American societies also created their own hospitals. In the early 20th century, it was not a given that African Americans would be admitted into many hospitals. If they were, they frequently had to face such indignities as being forced to bring their own eating utensils, sheets, and toothbrushes to pay for a black nurse if none was on staff. When the Knights and the Daughters of Tabor, Mississippi, a black fraternal society with a reach across only a few counties, opened Taborian Hospital in 1942. Membership nearly doubled in three years to 47, wait, wow, yeah, 47,000. Uh, mutual aid societies also founded 71 orphanages between 1890 and 1922, almost all without government subsidy. Perhaps the largest of these was Moose Heart, founded by the Loyal Order of Moose <laughs> in 1913. Hundreds of children lived there at a time. At a student newspaper, two debate teams, three theatrical organizations, and a small radio station. The success of Mooseheart alumni was remarkable. Alumni were four times more likely than the general population to have attended institutions of higher learning. Male alumni earned 71% more than the national average. 
and female alumni earn 63% more. Of course, with so many services being supplied by the Mutual Aid Society, many groups had reason to lobby government for its destruction. Because now you're encouraging your community to become independent, not so much dependent on the government. And of course, this goes back to where we actually use our voice to reach out and connect with one another uh, and talk about these problems that we share. Uh, and the underlying values that we have against using violence to solve our problems, we realize that we never needed government to begin with. So, of course, having uh, organizations like this <clears throat> is, goes in the face of government. Of course, un invariably, eventually, um, it's inevitable that government wants to get itself involved to prevent that. Um, so the first major blow against fraternalism occurred when the American Medical Association gained control of the licensing of medical schools. In 1912, a number of state medical boards formed the Federation of State Medical Boards, which accepted the AMA's ratings of medical schools as authoritative. The AMA quickly rated many schools as unacceptable. Consequently, the number of medical schools in America dropped from 166 in 1904 to 81 in 1918, a 51% drop. The increased price of medical services made it impractical for many lodges to retain the services of a doctor. Medical boards also threatened many doctors with being stripped of their licenses if they practice lodge medicine. And this is uh, another example of how licenses and permits discriminate against the well-educated poor, discriminates against uh, businesses that want to compete and provide a service to, to, to people who want them. You know, if you control uh, that kind of work but by the government then you control who has access to that who can provide that and i mean not as only as a tax source revenue but it can it uh they want to create this perceived uh, legitimacy that only government can can regulate you right you, you can't regulate yourself you can decide uh what's bad or what's good or they, they pretty much want to tell you that you're incompetent you're not uh, mature enough to be able to decide whether this is a good business service for you or not whether this individual can provide um, to, can, can meet your needs or preferences. And that's and the only best person who can decide that is you, right? The only best person who can decide what particular business service or product best suits your needs and preference is you. Not a stranger, not a political ruler, certainly not a government. It's, it's you, uh, the individual. So the next most damaging piece of legislation was the mobile law. The mobile law required that mutual aid societies show a gradual improvement in reserves. Until this time, societies had tended to keep low reserves in order to pay the maximum benefits possible to members. High reserve requirements made it difficult for societies to undercut traditional insurance companies. The mobile law also required a doctor's examination for all lodge members and forbade all speculative enterprises such as the extension of credit to members. By 1919, the mobile law had been enacted in the 40 tax farms. Mutual aid was hindered in other ways. Lodges were prohibited from providing coverage for children. This opened the door for commercial companies to offer industrial, industrial policies in which children's coverage was standard. The number of industrial policies rose from 1.4 million in 1900s to 7.1 million in the 1920s. By 1925, industrial policies surpassed the number of fraternal policies. Group medical insurance also eventually became tax deductible, while private plans such as those purchased through a lodge did not. And so fraternal, fraternal hospitals also came under attack. During the 1960s, the regulation of hospitals increased. Tabori Hospital in Mississippi was cited for inadequate storage and bed space, failure to install doors that could swing in either directions, and excessive reliance on uncertified personnel. A state hospital re regulator said of the Taborin Hospital, we're constantly told that you do not have the funds to do these things, make improvements. Yet, if you are to operate a hospital, something has to be done to meet the minimum standards of operations for Mississippi hospitals. Again, these uh, standards are all uh, subjective because these are, these are strangers. Again, deciding how best you should run your own practice, how best to run your own life, how best to run your own business or nonprofit organization. Whereas the only person in that particular area and field who wouldn't know how best to provide those services is you. Um, like farmers, for example, you know, you have the 
uh, USDA, you have the FDA, people who are not farmers, telling farmers like Joe Salatin how to how to take care of his animals, how to take care of his property, how to take care of the the, the, the abundance of, of, of good healthy food that he's allowed and permitted to grow. And a lot of these ways, this is another way to control you. You know, if it's something that's not uh, regulated, they don't notice it's not on the books, they're going to find uh, something as quick as possible to, to make a law for or against it. Um, because every, every law, though, still it's um, another source of revenue for the state. You know, if you make drugs illegal, you gain a lot of money through the drug war, for example, and paying uh, the, the salaries of the extortionists of the cops of the DEA, ATF, you know, uh, victimless crimes. So it also increases the power of the state. If you make uh, the drugs legal, you also create another um, prohibition era sort of type of administrative control over products again, over services. Now you're able to tax it. Um, so this is there's there's no win-win solution with government. You know, no matter what different way they would want to mislead you into believing that you know, oh, we can legalize drugs. Oh, we're going to legalize this or improve um, the sort of you know quality of standards in this particular area of industry, and that is it's all a lie. It's all a farce, it's all a way to mislead you into believing that government's out there actually looking for your best interest. And that's, you know, again, and the way they do that is by robbing from you first. So obviously, so of course, that's got to be a first indicator that the person stealing from you, you know, you still don't care what they do with that money. You still don't care what kind of um, false claim of charity they're going to do with that. You know, it doesn't matter. You know, don't argue from the effect of that. You know, it goes back to the basic principle that it was wrong and moral and evil to steal from me in the first place. Or grant me the freedom as a competent human being to decide with what best how I can use my resources for, right? To to have a choice. You know, under government you don't. Um, and so that's that's an example of the friendly societies and how they, they existed before the war on poverty, before Lyndon Johnson came in and further ruined um, people's lives. And you know, you look at food stamps for example, and when they started uh, passing that out, you know, when the uh, poverty rates were starting to decline because of these friendly societies. There were over 300,000 people in food stamps. Today, there's over 40 million now. You know, it's the complete opposite of direction, <laughs> right? And if you want to help someone, you know, you examine uh, the measure of success. Um, you know, if it would be uh, the, the rate of poverty is de decreasing, but it only continues to increase, then there's, there's a problem there. Right? And that's pretty much what you'll find with anything government gets itself involved in. Um, there's always the opposite that occurs and from its uh, you know, well intentions. So you know, that's something to keep in mind. You know, when you end the state, when you end the state services on Medicare, Medicaid, on, on welfare programs, we'll find a much better efficient way to help each other just like this six-year-old girl who, who, who has this empathy to, to reach out and want to give. You know, when, um, when we were free from this uh, extortion um, of the IRS, you know, stealing half of our income, you know, you free up a lot of different ways that we can help each other in a much more efficient and direct way possible. You know, there will always be people asking the question, what about the poor? What about you? What about my community? And the fact that people ask that question will always imply is an indicator that we already care for each other to begin with. So let's start off with that, with the first principles, and um, you know, let go of the idea that you need to steal from other people and strangers to, to take care of one of another. You know, they'll still be philanthropists. You know, they'll still be nonprofit organizations. They'll still be you asking, "What about the poor?" So with that, hopefully you enjoy this episode and these uh, the eleventh show of the Resistance, and I'll see you guys at the Victory Party.